Good morning. Try that one again. Good morning. morning. You're all masked, so you're not speaking. Is that it? As we reflect and worship, we are worshiping God who is gracious, extending a sovereign, saving favor to those who have no merit in them, and also Jehovah Shalom, independent self-existing one who is a God who brings peace. And then in Christ, Christ died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him and God saved us through the sanctifying work of his spirit. So as we think about worship, keep those thoughts in mind. A few announcements as we begin. Keep in mind Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, Men and Boys Fellowship here at the church building. You can place your offering in the offering box at the entryway there by the sound booth if you have offering. And next Sunday morning, Lord willing, we will have communion as we worship the Lord in that way. And also there's a home discipleship sheet in the vestibule by the bulletins if you want to pick one up if you're following the Bible reading, who we are in Christ, names and attributes of God, and so on. As we worship this morning, we're going to begin with prayer. And some of my prayers come from those that I have read. And this is one that is partially what I read and partially what I've added. So let's pray together. Father, we prefer our worship of you should be upbeat. We like it that the church is the happiest place in town. We take a glimpse of your promised kingdom as a venue where never is heard a discouraging word. But then reality, like suffering and death, like pandemic, virus, national unrest, like loss unimaginable. That reality breaks our happy illusion of a fairy tale life before the fall. And we are left with stone cold fear and bottomless need. So we cry out with urgent imperative, help, hear, save. We cry out along with the whole company of people of faith who have cried out. We cry out because our cry, since the lips of the slaves in Egypt, is our most elemental word back to you, our creator. We cry out, not in despair, but in confidence that you hear. You are the one, the only one who can turn sorrow to joy, mourning to dancing, weeping to laughter. So now God, who hears, helps and saves, hear, act, and make new. Give us courage and patience, grace in the virus and national unrest. Let us be rich in soul and poor in things, ordered for neighborliness, generous with goods, free of fear, but mostly grace in the virus virus and national unrest. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who defeated the power of death, overcame the forces of evil, ended the unbearable vexation of leprosy for some, and became Lord of the dance, the dance of well-being, gladness and peace. So we pray, so we trust, so we hope in you. Amen. We read a portion of scripture each week, reading Psalm 105 this week. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn there. And as we read Psalm 105, remember, it's good to remember. Alan? Psalms 105. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. 
His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the words he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. When they were but a few in number, few indeed, and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. He sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in shackles. His neck was put in irons. Till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The roar of people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed. To instruct his princes, he pleased and teached his elders wisdom. Then Israel entered Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people very fruitful. He made them too numerous for their foes, whose hearts he turned to hate his people, to conspire against his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, who he had chosen. They performed miraculous signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark, for had they not rebelled against his words, he turned their waters into blood, causing their fish to die. Their land teemed with frogs, which went up into the bedrooms of their rulers. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He turned their rain into hail with lightning throughout their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke, and the locusts came, grasshoppers without number. They ate up every green thing in their land, ate up the produce of their soil. Then he struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their manhood. He brought out Israel, laden with silver and gold, and from among them their tribes no one faltered. Egypt was glad when they left, because dread, because dread of Israel had fallen on them. He spread out a cloud as a covering, and a fire to give light at night. They asked, and he brought them quail, and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out like a river it flowed from the desert. For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. They gave him the lands of the nations, and they, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Alan. As we pray together as a congregation, I will begin praying for a number of items, followed by Jason praying for the uh, Stover family, missionaries that hope to get back to Israel soon. Talked to them this week, and uh, they're patiently waiting in Berwick, hoping to go to his parents in Canada sometime soon, and then hopefully get to Israel. But I'll begin, followed by Jason. Glorious Lord, we praise you and thank you for being in Christ, through your calling us, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the new birth. We are thankful for blessing us with every spiritual blessing in Christ, justification, Peace with you, Father, reconciliation, no condemnation, heirs of you, Father, co-heirs with Christ, redemption, forgiveness, plus a host of other blessings. Thank you for placing us in the body of Christ. We desire to be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another, forgiving, encouraging, rebuking, correcting, restoring one another in our relationships. 
Father, we pray for those who are facing trials of various types, Sam in Geneva, Bill Beam, Daniel in Alberta, Priscilla and Marty. I know some are going through financial difficulties and relational struggles, plus other trials. We would pray, Father, for those that are going through trials, that you might give them a spirit of wisdom and understanding that they might know you, experience you, enlighten the eyes of their heart that they might know the hope to which you have been called, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and your incomparably great power for them. May they choose an attitude of joy and then grant wisdom to trust you, decisions to be made to respond in light of your word. Since you're a God of encouragement, encourage in the inner person. And I pray, Father, that they will respond in their trials for your glory. And we as a body will continue to encourage and reach out and minister to one another. Thank you too, Father, for believers who are striving to work out their salvation with fear and trembling as they obey you. Just mentioned a few this morning. Daryl Krauss, Scott, and Darlene Pearson. And Father, as we do each week, pray for individuals listed in our prayer guide. Pray for Art and Rose Poor and Travala Price, that all of these individuals might be encouraged in the inner person through the work of your spirit. They might live and respond in light of the greatness of your love. And we desire, Father, that their love might grow and abound so that they might know what is best. I pray to Father for Art and Rose and their marriage. Art will be seeking to lead and love and nourish and cherish Rose and Rose following, complimenting Art. Give them wisdom in relating to grandchildren as they spend time with them to teach, to train, and to guide, and also wisdom in various family relationships. And Rose and her job to work hard is on to you. And I pray for Traviola. She continues to deal with grief and the passing of art that you would encourage, give understanding in relating to adult children and their families along with grandchildren. She could be a blessing and an encouragement to them, Father. Lord, we continue to pray that we will have wisdom to live well for your glory in the pandemic and national unrest. It affects us, some people deeply. We wear masks, which seems to hide expressions. School teachers are in new and changing norms, which may not really be a norm. Students are learning in different ways. Parents need wisdom in, to encourage their children Shopping is influence, plus other things. In the midst of that, we desire power, an understanding of your power that is at work in us in ways that we cannot imagine. And in the midst of it, we want to be a people that are giving thanks and praise to you. And in our weakness, we recognize that we grasp your strength. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Jason. Dear Father, you are so good to us. At times I'm amazed that things grow, that from a small sweet seed we receive back a dozen potatoes or two dozen tomatoes. A kernel of corn might produce a stock in an ear with dozens of kernels. As we understand it, we support Mike and Jessica in their efforts to share the seed of the message of Jesus. We desire that others would experience the love and forgiveness that we enjoy, and to that end we support them. Yet they and us this year are caught up in the effects and responses to the virus. We are told in the scriptures, many are the plans of of the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And elsewhere, we're commanded to pray if the Lord wills. So we, along with Mike and Jessica and their daughters, wait. We desire for life to return to what we call normal, for travel restrictions between various nations to be lifted, so that Mike and Jessica can again return to support their ministry. 
But at the same time, we acknowledge that your ways are beyond us and you have not revealed clearly to us what it is that you're doing right now. So we ask both for patience and trust. We ask that our faith and our hope be strengthened during this time of disruption. Teach us, Lord, both to know your love in Jesus. Teach us, Father, to remember that we in our small ways may plant seeds, but that you give the increase. Teach us to celebrate the abundance that is in creation apart from any act of us. Teach us to remember and hope that you may be at work even now in the lives of those to whom Mike and Jessica have ministered, even as they are restricted from traveling to see them. Teach us to know that though we may be bound and limited in the size of our gatherings by masks that many of us despise, by limited travel, and even by fear, you are not. You are a great God. And so I ask that we would be overwhelmed by the love that is given to us in Jesus, that we would walk in love, that we would trust you when we fail to do so and look to you as we wait. I pray this for Mike and Jessica and their daughters, that we together might be a people worthy of your name. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you, Jason. Sometimes we might ask ourselves, why do we pray in services? Because God calls us to do that. And as you read the epistles, you'll find that Paul many times mentioned how he prayed for those to whom he was ministering. In light of God and his greatness and who he is, we want to sing together from PowerPoint, How Great Thou Art. And again, reflecting God and his greatness in light of the scripture we read and in light of how we prayed.
then his greatness displayed his grace in Christ's coming. And because of Christ, we have a relationship with God. We're related to the body of Christ. And singing together, praise God for the body. And that ties in with the front of our bulletin where we want to care for and minister to one another. Singing together. today we need to practice body life day by day let's pray together father we thank you that we have a high priest in christ we can pray we can bring our burdens and our cares to you we thank you for giving us Not only the living Christ, but also your written word. As we look at a portion of it this morning, we want to be attentive hearers and doers of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I invite you to listen as I read several verses from 2 Corinthians. You don't need to look it up. Where Paul is speaking concerning difficulty he faced. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been in or been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, and I've often gone without food. I've been cold, and I've been naked. Paul experienced deep suffering as Christ's apostle. Christ had told him he would undergo deep suffering. This was God's call on his life. We don't, ex- don't expect to experience the same level of suffering since we're not apostles. Paul was in a different category, so to speak. However, we may experience some suffering along the way at times, as Peter's hearers did. The teen who in school would not participate in cheating and take some verbal backlash for that for weeks the employee, he, employee who would not hedge on time. I'm putting seven and a half hours on my timesheet. That's what we worked, and the rest are saying, let's put eight hours. If you put seven and a half and we work together, you're going to make us look bad if we put eight. He says, no, I'll stick to seven and a half. I will be honest because I walk with God, and he takes some heat for that. The young adult who would not go partying with his friends as he did in the past because he came to Christ 
and he no longer wanted to be involved in those activities. And he took some criticism for that. Now, I want you to think about a time when you may have taken some suffering just because of your standing for Christ, or maybe some in the future that you could see being a reality. And I want you to fix that in your mind. And as we go through the passage in 1 Peter 4, I want you at times to recall what you are going through. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter writes to God's elect who are experiencing some fiery, painful trials due to obedience in Christ. These trials are not due to that which is beyond ordinary living, but just comes because of ordinary routine living, their faith, living out obedience to the Lord. As an example, one of Peter's hearers may say, I will not slander the government. And because they don't participate in slandering the government of that day, they took some criticism. Or a slave who willingly and eagerly submitted to his master. And other people said, why are you responding with an eager willingness, submission to your master? Because of God's call in my life. That's what I am to do. So the people to whom Peter is writing are living for God's glory in a world which in some ways, is going a different direction. First Peter 4, beginning with verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter is encouraging his hearers to live with hope in the present world, reminding them that there will be some suffering. In chapter 4, 1 through 6, he encourages them, if you do suffer, he doesn't say you dogmatically will, but if you do suffer, accept it. In verses 7 through 11 of chapter 4, he says the end is near, so live well. And then in 12 through 19, he encourages them, again, how to respond. And we have looked at 12 through 14, just a quick review. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the faint painful trials you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. So if living at your faith, you go through some suffering, don't be alarmed. Don't think it's strange. But, in verse 13, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. You participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If the possibility... If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Think about insulted for the name of Christ. In the same sentence as blessed, and then for the spirit of glory and of God rest on you. The spirit that rested on Christ is the same spirit that rests on Peter's hearers as they go through difficulty. And the same spirit that would rest on us today. Then he goes on in verse 15. If you suffer, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. Now, apparently, there's more than one kind of suffering. Peter's been talking about the suffering because of their faith. But there's also suffering that comes if one's a murderer. 
there's a price to be paid. A thief, there's a price to be paid. Any other kind of criminal, there's a price to be paid. And then I find it interesting that he says, or even as a meddler, meddlers, you know, the idea is being a busy body in other people's business. Meddlers tend to suffer as a result of their actions. And Peter says believers are not to meddle in the affairs of others. And just as a sidelight, I would ask, I wonder how much we as believers will meddle today in other people's business in a political situation or concerning politicians, other people's lice on the jobs or neighbors. Did you hear about and, you know, we meddle in other people's business? And I'm not answering this. This is just a question. How much news is meddling Is Facebook at times meddling? How about gossip? But Peter says, if you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer, a thief, or any kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. Notice what he says then in verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian in one's walk with God, If you suffer as a Christian, people to whom Peter is writing, he had said in chapter 3 that you are to repay evil with blessing. A neighbor criticizes, and the normal response is to criticize back. But Peter says to the hearers, help him with a project as an example, rather than repaying Evil with evil. A wife who is freely submitting to her husband, as mentioned in chapter 6, 1 through 3. Not out of bitterness, not out of a have to, not seeing herself as a second or third rate citizen. But just freely submits to her husband. Takes some heat for that. But as a Christian, if you suffer. Or in light of chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Someone says, well, I'm not going to participate in that kind of evil anymore. I used to participate with you, but I'm not going to do it now because I've come to Christ and I'm not interested in that. And they take some suffering. Peter says in that context, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. The idea of shame here is to be confounded, to be considered dishonorable. Now, Peter would have been writing to an audience that was a culture of shame and honor. And we today do not live in that type of culture. We live in a culture where we're very individualistic. You know, we can do our own thing. But in a shame and honor culture, you have family involved, you have a community involved, and if you did not respond according to the norms of the family and the community, you were shamed. You live in shame. You were, in essence, rejected. Even if it was wrong, you still were to do wrong because that was the way the family or community lived. Peter is saying, if you suffer, don't be ashamed. Now, let me give you an example coming from Peter's day. Repaying evil with blessing. Someone in the church, or the churches to whom Peter is writing, been mistreated. And the norm in the community is that when you're mistreated, you return evil for evil. This believer chooses not to return evil for evil, and they're ostracized by the community because they return good for evil. That's not the cultural norm. That's not the family norm. So they're pushed aside. What's wrong with you? Shame. Kind of like maybe a shunning. Another example coming from Peter's day in light of 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 is that a husband in that culture, in the family norm, the culture norm, was considered above his wife. And in obedience to Christ, he's considering his wife on an equal level. He's considerate of her, treating her as an heir together 
of the grace of God. And other men look at him and say, Foo you and you. Shame. You're not following our norm of saying wives are third or fourth rate citizens. That's where he's coming from. He says, do not be ashamed. And then notice the word, but praise God that you bear his name. You who return blessing for evil and you're going through some rejection because of that, you're being shunned, praise God. Husband that has been treating his wife with consideration and an heir of the gracious gift of life, shunned, not following the culture norm, he says, praise God that you bear his name. Oh, how we need to adjust as Peter's hearers, and I think us today, thinking concerning suffering for Christ. It seems sometimes we escape, would sooner escape suffering than praising God's name. We seek to stop persecution rather than praising God in the midst of being rejected. Now notice how Peter goes on. In verse 17, he stated in verse 16, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God for it is time. He's giving two reasons in verses 17 and 18, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then a second reason in verse 18 and If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Your suffering, don't be ashamed. Praise God. Because judgment begins with the family of God. The idea of judgment is to make a distinction between You know, a sentence of an administration of justice is being given. And I make, I make a judgment quite often as I garden. Tomatoes are all done now, but uh, I remember going sometimes, I'd say, oh, a lot of nice ripe tomatoes there. And I would judge the tomatoes. I'd look at one and there was a little bruise there, you know, a little rot starting. And I look at the other and I'd say, this is real good. What have I done? I made a judgment. I made a distinction. Some I would take home. And some might even say, we're leaving the garden. Here he says, judgment begins with the family of God. Judgment seems to be tied in with God's eschatological calendar of judging in the future. If Christians are judged, so will those that don't obey the gospel. Go back to chapter 2 and verse 4. He talks about the family of God. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you are also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Here he talks about believers being living stones built into a spiritual household. In chapter 2 and verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. In verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Ties in with what he says in chapter 4. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. Now this is in the context of believers going through difficulty because of their faith. God's administration of justice includes believers. In fact, it begins with them, with others to follow. Peter assumes that his Christian readers will be judged along with the rest of humanity. His thought is informed by the tradition in Judaism that when God judges, 
He begins with his own people and, in fact, with the elders at the temple. Two specific passages come to mind. We won't look at them this morning, but I'll mention them. Zechariah 13, 9 and Malachi chapter 3, 1 through 4, where judgment of Israel is taking place, but it's beginning with leaders, the priest, and then to the people. And when we get to chapter 5 next week, Lord willing, we find that he speaks to elders. And that seems to be tied in with judgment that is taking place. So the fiery judgment of God in these passages is alluded to with the phrase painful trial in verse 12. Judgment beginning with the family of God. Now, the passages that I mentioned in Zechariah and Malachi are tied in with judgment due to violating God's covenant. In 1 Peter, the judgment is because of believers obeying God's plan and will. Both are judgments, but for a different reason. Obedient individuals are judged in 1 Peter through suffering. The unbelievers will be judged in a different way. And that ties in with what Matthew 23 would talk about, that God judges the sheep and the goats, judging his own people first, and then the goats to follow. Now in verses 17 and 18, I think Peter's writing to be an encouragement. You say, how can the fact that you're being judged be an encouragement. Peter is not warning of a coming judgment to be feared, but he's encouraging them in the midst of a genuine judgment. People are making or drawing conclusions about the people to whom Peter is writing as they draw conclusions about us and saying, shame, because you're not responding according to community norms or family norms. But a judgment is taking place. That judgment shows that Peter's hearers are genuine. But stands in contrast to the end of verse 17. What will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? The fiery trial of Peter's hearers is God's justice being executed. God's justice means believers suffer for obedience, thus being displayed as genuine. Fiery trials separate the genuine from the false. And this is an encouragement to them. They're going through fiery trials. He mentioned them in chapter 1. He mentions them here. They're being criticized. They're taking some heat for their obedience. It's resulted in trial, but it's demonstrating their genuineness. That's part of God's judgment. It's allowing other people to judge. But he says then at the end of verse 18... I'm sorry, verse 17. And if judgment begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? So you're going through difficulty because of your obedience. What's going to happen to those who don't obey the gospel? And the idea of not obeying the gospel is that they won't be persuaded. They're uncompliant. They're disobedient. You can look at some parallel passages. We won't turn to any of these, but in John 3 and verse 36, the word rejected is used for the same Greek word. In Acts 14 and verse 2, they refuse to believe. In Acts 19 and verse 9, they refuse to believe. In Romans 2 and verse 8, they reject the truth. In Romans 10, 21, they're disobedient. In Romans 11, 30 and 31, 
disobedient. Second Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. They reject. The context in First Peter here is that there's a willful, strong rejection of the gospel of God. And if you look at First Peter 1, 2, 3 through 5, 7, Chapter 2, 6 through 8, chapter 2, 21 through 25, and so on. The gospel of God is centered in the person of Jesus Christ. So we have one group of people that are obeying God. They've come to faith in Christ, and they're being judged. And they're being demonstrated as genuine. And then Peter says, if that happens to you, how about those who willfully reject the gospel? He's encouraging them. You're going through difficulty for your obedience. But think about those that are disobedient to the gospel. They too will be judged. Simple question. Have you obeyed the gospel of God? If God is working in you, why don't you come to Christ? Peter's point. If you're experiencing trials due to obedience... What will be the outcome for those who don't obey the gospel? And then notice in verse 18. In verse 18, and. He's given a second reason for them to obey. If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will be the outcome for the sinner? Now, verse 18 is a quote from Proverbs 11 and verse 31. In Proverbs 11 and 31 And we want to go back there for just a minute. We find that Solomon, in the context, you know, in some Proverbs prior to chapter 11 and verse 31, he's been talking about righteous people in contrast to evil people. So in verse 31, if the righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner. Now, when Peter refers to that, he says, if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will the outcome be for the ungodly? One comment from a book that is a commentary on the New Testament, use of the Old Testament, and the writers say, To say that salvation is difficult for the righteous is not to say that God finds it terribly difficult to save them, that one should never downplay the cost of the atonement, but rather that God's people, in line with Jesus' own instruction, enter the narrow gate and and face the opposition of the world from which they have sprung. Believers come from a world that is wide and enter a narrow gate. Implicitly, this is a challenge to Peter's hearers to follow through to the end, to preserve to the end. Earlier, the motive that Peter offered his readers was their opportunity to glorify God by their suffering. Their pleasure is being associated with Pleasure in being associated with the name of Christ. Here he provides a different motive. They are never to feel envious of the oppressors and persecutors. For those who reject the gospel will suffer much more than any Christian has had to face in this life. If it is hard for the righteous to be saved in this earth... There's difficulty, there's trials, there's a narrow gate, there's a narrow path. What will become of the ungodly? Those that don't walk with God and the sinner. He's encouraging them as they're going through persecution, as they obey God. Yes. Judgment is taking place with the family of God. I'm sifting out who is genuine and who isn't genuine. But what will happen to those 
who don't obey the gospel. Yes, as you live for the Lord, it's hard. So what will the outcome be for the ungodly and the sinner? And then in verse eight or 19, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Those who suffer according to God's will. In chapter 1 and verse 6 of 1 Peter, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So then, you're suffering according to God's will. Suffering as one is seeking to obey God is God's will. If it comes, that's God's will. That's part of his judgment. What should the person do, whether it be Peter's, hearers, or the church down through the ages, or the church today? Commit themselves to their faithful creator. One of the most freeing things in life is to simply commit ourselves to God. And he's writing to those who are going through fiery trials. You're suffering according to God's will. Now commit yourself to your faithful creator. And continue to do good. Just continue to do good. As you look at church history, you will find repeatedly people went through difficulties at times. Not always, but at points in time there was greater difficulty than other points in time. And over and over again, believers were shamed. They were alienated. But they kept doing good. And that's Peter's encouragement to those to whom he is writing. Commit yourself to your faithful creator. God, I don't make any sense of this. Peter would say, I know. Commit yourself to God, your faithful creator. Well, what do I do? Continue to do good. But I'm taking a lot of heat for it. Continue to do good where Peter's coming from. Commit yourself to your creator and continue to do good. So in the midst of suffering, not as a murderer or thief or criminal or a meddler, but as a Christian, Peter says, don't be ashamed. Praise God that you bear that name. Judgment is taking place. Yes, you're being judged. You're being demonstrated as genuine. But remember, those that don't obey the gospel will be judged. The ungodly and the sinner will be judged. So if you suffer, commit yourself to your faithful creator and continue to do good. Now in PowerPoint, I want to just mention perhaps some thoughts on applying this passage in our lives. I should expect some suffering due to obeying Christ. I'm not saying how much or how great, but don't be surprised if we suffer. I will rejoice that I participate in the sufferings of Christ. I will be overjoyed when Christ's glory is revealed. That's something yet future. When insulted, I'll bless. If I suffer due to Christ, I should not be ashamed. Suffering now is showing I'm genuine. There is a coming judgment for those who don't obey the gospel. 
and the ungodly. I will commit myself to my faithful creator and continue to do good. Just take a couple examples and think about what you thought about earlier also. Maybe some suffering you went through because of your stand for Christ and apply it to what's on PowerPoint. But take the employee who works eight hours and wants to put eight hours down and because he worked eight hours. And taking some heat for that because some of his co-workers, when there's a break, want to take 30 minutes rather than 15. And an hour break for lunch rather than a half hour. And no, we got to get back to work. 15 minutes is up. 30 minutes is up. Ah, oh, you goody two-shoe. You know, you're messing it up for the rest of us. I should expect some suffering for obeying Christ. I will rejoice that I participate in the sufferings of Christ. I will be overjoyed when Christ's glory is revealed. When in sought it, I'll bless. If I suffer due to Christ, I should not be ashamed. Suffering is now is shown I'm genuine. There's a coming judgment for those who don't obey the gospel and the ungodly. I will commit myself to my faithful creator and continue to do good. How about the wife who refuses to go along with other women who are bashing men? Well, you know what men are like. All men are like that. And just, you know, ladies are talking about bashing men. The lady says, I can't participate. I respect my husband. I submit to his leadership. It is rejected, is shamed because of that. And she thinks, I should expect some suffering due to obeying Christ. I will rejoice that I participate in the sufferings of Christ. I will be overjoyed when Christ's glory is revealed. When in sought it, I'm blessed. If I suffer due to Christ, I should not be ashamed. Suffering now is showing I'm genuine. There's a coming judgment for those who don't obey the gospel of God. I will commit myself to my faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter is writing to hearers in a certain cultural setting. Our cultural setting would be somewhat different. But the call to obey is present. And if that obedience to Christ results in some suffering, Peter says, you're blessed. And some of that suffering for some people may be very difficult. Others may not go through a lot, but at least having a mindset of, here's how I want to respond if and when it comes my way. Let's pray together. Father, we know that Peter is writing to your elect. They were strangers in the world, but they experienced the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. And we know in that setting It resulted in some fiery trials, some suffering. And we know down through the pages of church history, at times there was fiery suffering. At other points in time, there was not as much. But yet, the suffering, form of your judgment. So in the day and age in which we live, we in our country may not go through a tremendous amount of suffering. It may take place in some subtle ways and maybe more clear ways. But it's our desire as a body of believers to be obedient to you, to live out our faith. And if we take some heat for it, may we continue to commit ourselves to you as our faithful creator 
and continue to do good. If we don't have a lot, may we still live well. And if in the future, in our country, we were to take more persecution because of our faith, may we have a mindset of what we have discussed this morning, just to live well as we obey you. We don't want to measure ourselves by how much we suffer or don't suffer. We want to be obedient where you placed us, where you have called us for your glory. Thank you, Father, for working in us, drawing us to yourself, and we can live in sensitivity to you. Encourage us as a body as we live in sensitivity to you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.